virtual machine that you can run on your hypervisor of choice. I run mine on, uh, on my laptop quite a bit. I do most of my demos from this, from this software. Um, and you can see on the left-hand side some tabs that, if you're familiar with our UI, you probably don't see these. These really just apply to the emulator. But our API model documentation is contained in the, in the emulator. We talked about that managed object browser. That's exposed here you know, with a nice uh, link. And uh, my platform emulator is configured to show a couple of chassis and, and uh, I think maybe about six or eight blades. So for example, if I were to, uh, to search compute blade, which I know is the class for um, our blades, this is actually going to go out and uh, find every instance of that class in my platform emulator. And you can see it comes back with the class names, you know, certainly all the properties associated. I can see uh, you know, whether or not my blade is assigned with a service profile, if it's operable, um, some of the details around uh, what's inside that blade, its model number, number of CPUs and such. Uh, so again, this is a, a great tool to sort of look under the covers and see you know, what's, what's in that model. Um, what's queryable, what's configurable, how objects relate to each other. Uh, again, the API model documentation is here. Um, our schema files, for folks that are, you know, really want to dig in, um, our XML schema files, which define what can be read or written to the model, are, are here for your viewing. Um, we only have a single API. A lot of vendors tend to have APIs for their chassis, APIs for their blades. We took a different approach with this system. We have one single and very you know, deep API and we fully document it and, and certainly give it to our customers and partners to use. We don't reserve any special uh, you know, commands for our own use. Let's see, and uh, I'll, I'll go into one other you know, interesting feature on the emulator, and that's um, uh, its startup inventory. I can, you know, ultimately I can tell the emulator to expose um, anything I'd like to see that I, that I might see in a live UCS domain some number of racks, uh, of rack mount servers, some number of chassis or blades. I can even point the emulator to my live system. Let's say I have a system in my lab or in production. I can have it take that configuration in uh, so that I have a sandbox to play with on my laptop, a place to test my scripts, maybe to test my, my API integration. So a very, a very useful tool. And again, uh, this is free of charge. You can find this as you navigate through developer.cisco.com and look for the UCS related uh, area under data center. So in terms of the API, you know, any anybody have any questions or um, yeah. anything even related to just the UCS, um, you know, the earlier slides, the hardware components, the software components? Sure. Um, when? I know we've got a we've got a mic right here. Yeah. All right. It's mostly so I can hear you too. You can go in and configure at a very granular level, you know, just what you're looking for, um, either to query, you know, or, or to make a change. So absolutely. But on the other side of the spectrum, if you wanted to, if you're bringing up, let's say, a new UCS domain in a data center, you can send one big XML file to do all your configuration, um, which which can be powerful as well. But you have both ends of the spectrum. Uh, and if, for folks that didn't hear the beginning of the question, um, the, the question was, when you're Interacting with the XML, can you go in and make a small change without having to sort of replace, you know, the whole XML structure? And the answer is no. You can go in and make very granular changes or very wide changes. Any other questions about anything? <laughs> yeah.
see. And end host mode is, is the question. Um, and I think the question is you've got a network team and a server team working together. You saw the role based authentication model. How, you know, how do those things work together? Um, end host mode definitely is our recommendation. It's very, a very simplified method of getting the UCS connected to the system. Ultimately, UCS is a layer two platform. We stop at layer two at the Fabric Interconnects. Uh, in terms of the role based authentication model, what's great is you can have your server team and your network team work together before you deploy UCS and sort of plan out how you want. Uh, your servers to access the network. The network team can help define uh, policies and templates that the server admins will use. And by doing that, you can limit what the server admin has access to, making sure that you know, everything accesses the network in a way that you know, is, is in line with how the network team wants to manage the infrastructure. So although um, there's network access elements inside UCS, you can still have a great level of control. That network team, team can still you know, define how the server team will, will access that network and, and stay within the boundaries that, uh, that they want to have in place. Okay, Nexus 1000V is, a, is an additional um, a, a vSwitch replacement within the ESX, ESX hypervisor. Uh, what's great about that is you get a, a familiar interface that, that a network admin would be used to, CLI commands, NXOS, um, and uh, the ability to manage network access for many, many virtual machines um, across many domains, potentially. So um, that's, a, from a network admin's perspective, they can log in and completely control how the VMs access the network, create policies that you know, stick to those VMs, even if they move between uh, hosts or, or between domains. Um, but, uh, I know we've got some booths out on the world of solutions where some of the Network 1000V experts are on the Nexus team. So you, you may, I believe, yes, yeah, so it's, it's in South or, or South uh, below. We have some features with uh, Internet and UCS Manager, like called LAN and SAN connectivity policies. For environments that really want to segregate your networking and your server guys from each other, where you, you want to kind of do more of the traditional model where I let the network guys plug my servers, you know, in our case virtually, it's more the logical config, but you know, where they're used to plugging in physically the, the cables to the back of the server and connecting them to switch. Our LAN and SAN connectivity policies give you that kind of capability with role-based administration because you can give a role to a server guy that all he can do is create a service profile and consume these connectivity policies. And the connectivity policies define basically are, are things that are defined by your LAN and SAN team that say, I want you know these four NICs connected to uh, you know this XYZ and ABC VLAN and and whatnot, and, but the server guy can't actually change them. So in highly compliant environments where you want to have that segregation of duties and such, that's, that's a good recommendation of looking at um, features specifically for the use case of you having a network guy and a server guy work and manage your UCS servers together. When you have a large farm of servers too, if you're using a hypervisor, you've got many, many hosts, um, using, a, using a policy like that to manage the access um, is huge because you you know you tend to have config drift in traditional environments. If you've got a hundred servers that should be configured identically, are they really? Um, but if you're you know, using a centralized you know, policy or template in UCS, you know they're configured the way they should. And when you want to make changes down the road, add a VLAN, add a NIC to a server, you're making the change in one place and, and affecting you know all the servers that need to be affected. You're welcome. More questions? It does. The question is, does the role-based access apply to uh, any of the folks that are interacting with the XML API? So absolutely, when you, when, you, when you talk to the XML API, once you authenticate, you're providing your credentials. Um, and at, that, at the time that the user credentials are, are exchanged, the DME will know what, what rights that user has and whether they should be able to make the change that they're asking for in the document. Because since it's using the same XML API that our GUI does, so when you log in with the user and password with our GUI, 
if you're logging directly to the API, you're getting, it, it'll provide you back a set of roles and, and privileges that you have as a particular user. Uh -huh. Am I a, just a read-only user? I can't do anything, but I can view, or do I have administrative privileges and, or somewhere in between? Changes would the would the system actually come back with errors, or would it just not make those changes? It would. It would come back with an error, so you know, you know you didn't have permission to make that particular change. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome.